go if you don't do anything. It will affect the diaphragm, uh, the, the intercostals, and, and the cause of death would be respiratory paralysis. So it's an interesting disease. And this was the place, well, not today, but the nervous system uh, was the place to bring it up. And I neglected to do it, so I still can pick it up. <clears throat> Just before we jumped into the endocrine system, which is where we are. So, no, don't save that. All right, so uh, endocrine system is where we are. First thing to do is to talk about the word and sort of compare it with another word. So uh, endocrine. a type of gland they're ductless glands so their products which are hormones are released into the blood They travel everywhere and depend on receptors to know where to act. So you dump cortisone, estrogen, testosterone, insulin, glucagon, any hormone, you uh, thyroxin, any hormone you've heard of, any hormone you want to use as an example. The gland that makes it, okay, so testicles make testosterone, ovaries make estrogen, thyroid gland makes thyroxin, adrenal gland makes cortisone, whatever hormone you want to use as an example, you dump it into the blood, it goes everywhere. And it exerts an effect when it encounters a cell that has a receptor. We actually call these cells target tissues. All right, the other word, exocrine, is also A type of gland. These glands have ducts. And so they deposit their product wherever it needs to go to do whatever it needs to do. So just to be crystal clear and ask you a stupid question that a kindergartner could answer, where does the salivary gland deposit saliva? Now, nobody in the room thinks the salivary gland deposits saliva in the rectum or in the blood, and hopefully it finds its way to the mouth. The salivary gland dumps saliva into the mouth. Well, there's another reason for bringing this up. One, one reason, obviously, is that you've got to be crystal clear on all of this. But another reason for bringing this up, and just continue your chart if you have room. I, I don't. The word endocrine is also the name of a system. Now, humans like to 
extrapolate. And so one will say, well, if endocrine and exocrine are two different types of glands, and if endocrine is the name of a system, then exocrine must be kind of the opposite system. And they would be wrong. You're far enough along in your study of anatomy and physiology. You've looked at the table of contents of your textbook. You've been through elementary school, middle school, and high school. You have never in your life heard of the exocrine system. Let's talk about the respiratory system. Let's talk about the digestive system. Let's talk about the urinary system. Let's talk about the reproductive system. Nobody's ever said to you, today we're going to talk about the exocrine system. You've never seen it in the table of contents of your book, but it is a common mistake that people make. Again, if both words refer to a type of gland and endocrine is the name of a system, they assume that exocrine must also be. It is not. You probably knew that, so I just wasted your time, but I need to make sure that you do know that. I want to tell you about another disorder now that shows us how important it is, how necessary, how absolutely required it is for hormones to have receptors so that they can act on target tissues or so that they know what the target tissues are. So to make the point of the necessity of receptors so that hormones know where to act, I want to talk about a disorder called testicular feminization. primary sex characteristics are when you're born, do you look like a boy or do you look like a girl? Do you have a penis or do you have a vagina? Your second, not to be confused with your secondary characteristics, which are the things that happen at puberty. So at birth, the primary sex characteristics are female. So whether uh, you had an ultrasound and you know, wanted to know the sex of the baby or whether you didn't know until birth, you, you've got a little girl. You're thrilled to death, proud, happy. You take her home and you do whatever you do with little girls. Right or wrong, we tend to raise them differently. I know I painted my little boy's room blue and my little girl's room pink. Bought dresses for her. I never bought a dress for my son, although Teddy Roosevelt wore, wore dresses. All babies did in those days. Anyway, well, right or wrong, we tend to raise our children differently grossly differently, but you know, the way we dress up, things like that. So your little girl grows up, and she's cute, and a little bubbly, nice child, fun to have around, and pretty soon you've got an 11 or 12 year old, 13 year old, all her friends are uh, starting to develop breast, and, and they're getting their first period, and your little girl's not. You go to the doctor, and the doctor says, ah, it's, it's too early to worry. I know that you know puberty seems like it's younger with every generation, and it is. But uh, yeah, she's only twelve. You know we're not going to worry about it yet. So you take her home, and you know keep raising your little girl. And then you got a fifteen-year-old, a sixteen-year-old girl. No, no, no breast, no period. Uh, a technical term you'll read is infantile genitalia. And so you go back to the doctor. Okay, something's wrong now. You know we've, we've got to you know explore this. And um, 
So they, uh, they look at the blood and they find uh, high levels of testosterone that would be consistent with being a male and they find low levels of estrogen, which would also be consistent with being a male. So why does my little girl have all this testosterone and no estrogen? Well, let's look at the genetic makeup, karyotype. The little girl's not a little girl. He's a little boy, 44XY. Well, if he's a male and he's producing testosterone, why, why, why was he born, you know, uh, looking like a female? Well, he lacks receptors for testosterone. So during embryogenesis, when these three structures, which you heard of last semester, but you weren't all here, so I'm going to tell you about them again. And as I did last semester, I will spare you the names until we get there, and we'll get there in the context of the endocrine system. But if you are a uh, 24XY uh, male, probably have testosterone. If you're 44XX, you're a female, you probably don't have testosterone. That's what determines the fate of these three indifferent structures. You see, lay people would assume that males being 44XY having testosterone are born with male parts, penis, testicle, scrotum, etc. And female, being 44XX, having estrogen, would be born with female parts. But that's not how it works. And again, if you were with me last semester, you'd know that, but you weren't all with me, so we're having to talk about it again. The thing that makes a female have female parts <clears throat> is not the estrogen, And if you're wondering why we talked about this last semester, if you want to go home and read about it in your notes, we talked about it in the context of reviewing biochemistry, specifically hydrophobic molecules. After we talked about fats and oils, we talked about cholesterol, we talked about steroids, estrogen, testosterone, and cortisone. So the female, 44XX, develops the female parts, not because she has estrogen, but because she lacks testosterone. Estrogen doesn't play a role until puberty. So as embryos, we all have these three indifferent structures. If you have testosterone, structure number one, becomes the glans penis. If you don't have testosterone, it becomes the clitoris. They are essentially the same thing. If you have testosterone, structure number two becomes the shaft of the penis. Without testosterone, <laughs> Structure number two becomes the labia minora. 
as we'll see in a little more detail when we, when we get to the reproductive hormones, a penile shaft is actually nothing more than labia minora that have fused. You can have children born with what are called indifferent genitalia, and you are looking at the genitals and trying to decide if what you see is a penile shaft that is partially fused, not completely fused, and should be sutured shut, or if you have partially fused labia minora, which should be open, because everything doesn't always work, you know, like, like it does in a textbook. What if the person is a male, but they don't have enough testosterone? What if the person is a female, but they have a little too much testosterone? And we'll get into all of that in the context of uh, the reproductive system and endocrinology come, coming up here very quickly. Structure number three becomes the scrotum or the labia majora. So now, what happened to this child? Ultrasound, or if no ultrasound at birth, doctor said, oh, you're gonna have a little girl. You had a little girl. She never hit puberty did some testing, you find out you don't have a little girl, you have a little boy. Lacks receptors for testosterone. So right here, without the testosterone, the indifferent structures developed into the female structures. Have to have receptors, endocrine glands, ductless glands, dump their products into the blood. Their products are called hormones. The hormones go everywhere. They only exert an effect on target tissues. Target tissues are tissues with receptors for that hormone. Disorder written up here? Yeah. Okay. Got a mess to tell you all about it, not name it. All right, so endocrine versus exocrine. <clears throat> The uh, chemicals that we're talking about are uh, lumped into this, this group called chemical messengers. And the group of chemical messengers that we will spend the most time talking about, of course, are the hormones. <coughs> but it's, uh, as I regret saying, for the sake of completeness, it makes sense to list the various categories of chemical messengers right here. Uh, <coughs> Neurotransmitters we've talked about. We'll talk about some more because epinephrine, is it a hormone or a neurotransmitter? Yes. Both. So we'll talk some more about uh, epinephrine. Prostaglandins, uh, been there, done that. And pheromones are uh, sometimes covered in 201, but uh, I don't know if I did or not. Again, you weren't all with me, so. Let's talk for a minute about pheromones. <clears throat> pheromones are interesting chemicals. <clears throat> uh, now the thing is, you see, your, your hormone, hormones, pheromones kind of rhyme. Your hormones stay in you, okay? Your, your estrogen, your testosterone, your cortisone, your oxytocin, whatever hormone you want to use as an example. It, it only affects you. It doesn't affect your friends, your neighbors, your whatever, children, parents, it only affects you. In contrast, your pheromones affect other people. Or, talking about a dog, they affect other dogs.
So we're all releasing these pheromone substances and we're detecting other people's pheromones through some type of poorly understood olfactory mechanism. We may have no awareness of the fact that we're, we're detecting pheromones. There, 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 there may be an odor associated with them, but there doesn't have to be an odor associated with them. The best understood example of pheromones in the population at large is a male dog marking his territory. Of course, if you have a spayed female, you know that they behave just like a male insofar as raising their leg and tinkling when, when they walk or when you walk them. And you know, if you walk a male dog on a leash, uh, you know, he'll tinkle every couple of feet. And if you really look, like only I would do that, but if you really look, it oftentimes it's like nothing even came out, you know, a microliter here and there. And of course, it's a territorial thing. And lots of other animals <coughs> do, do the same thing. And again, spayed females, they'll, they'll behave pretty much like, like a male in that regard. Well, those are pheromones. I think in that example, I say I think because I'm not a dog and I don't walk around trying to smell it, but I think in that example that, that it is a conscious awareness of the, the, the pheromone and that the odor is detected, but it's still a pheromone. In humans, the best understood example among just population at large is when females live together, sometimes their menstrual cycles become synchronized. <clears throat> this can be uh, just two girls that you know share a, a house or apartment. It can be a, a stereotypical family where there's a mother and a daughter or two or three. It can be a more traditional university like University of Colorado Boulder or University of Alabama where the boys join uh, fraternities and the girls join sororities and so in the sorority house there's you know, 20 girls and they're all in sync. This can be the state mental health facility in Pueblo and all the female patients can be in sync. So it can be as big or as small as, as you want. We'll talk about the why in a minute. Another uh, example of that is, uh, uh, not of that, but another example in, in people is, uh, oh, well, and, and the, the menstrual cycle synchronization thing. And people aren't aware of that. I mean, they, they may know that their, their period comes at the same time as their roommate's period, but there's no, you know, conscious awareness of, of, of an odor. The other uh, good example in people uh, and some social scientists actually did this. I don't know what prompted them to do it, but uh, they rubbed body secretions on women's breasts, women that had breastfeeding babies. And I mean, every body secretion, saliva, um, under the arm, moisture, whatever you call that, sweat perhaps, urine, everything you can imagine. And it, it increased the uh, desire of their babies to feed. All right, so why, 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 do, why are these things going on? Well, the answer in both cases, the, the breastfeeding as well as the synchronization of menstrual cycles, and in a nutshell, the answer is because all living things are similar. Now you, can, you can choose right here to say all living things are similar because God created us, or you can choose right here to say all living things are similar because we evolved from a common ancestor. So you can choose God and creation or Darwin and evolution. Or you can choose both. So you can choose to say God created evolution. So that, that part's personal. You get to pick that part. It's none of my business. But the fact of the matter is, all living things are similar. Mushrooms use ATP as cellular energy. So do mosquitoes. Whether it was God or Darwin, or both of them working together, they did not go back to the drawing board for every species and say, okay, what are we gonna make the Krebs cycle look like in giraffes? Got that done, all right, now let's work on the zebra. 
What's, well, they're both mammals. We'll make it the same. How about a blue spruce tree? What's the Krebs cycle going to look like? It's all the same, okay? It's all the same. All living things are similar. So if, if that's the case, do other animals, can you think of examples of some non-human animals whose reproductive cycles need to be synchronized? Mm -hmm. Pretty much everything. Not domesticated animals. I mean, your dog it lives in a house just like you do. But, but what do you suppose would happen if an elk gave birth in February? Babies would die. Babies would die. So animals like that have mating seasons. They have birthing seasons. As far as I understand it, they give birth in the spring. So the babies have the spring, summer, and fall to get big enough to survive their first winter. That's why these cycles are necessary and exist. We don't need them. We have them because we share them with other animals. Okay, answer's the same for the breastfeeding thing. Just slightly different. Woman has a baby. Uh, my God, a lactation consultant comes by and explains how breastfeeding works and prolactin versus oxytocin and the reflex known as the letdown reflex, which is technically called milk ejection and why the woman can't breastfeed immediately and when she'll be able to. It's all very orchestrated. Mom takes the baby, brings it to the breast. But have you ever seen dogs born? First of all, they're born blind, and they have to find the food. How do they find the food? How do they even know they're supposed to find the food? Okay. So other animals need these pheromone-type things that are associated with breastfeeding. So anyway, interesting examples. Um, pheromones have been associated with uh, being sexual attractants. Uh, back in the 70s or so, there was a cologne, and I don't know that it, I don't know if it still exists or not, but it was called musk oil, and uh, you were supposed to buy the musk oil and splash it on, and you know, it was a sexual attractant and all that. And, uh, one summer, uh, after telling this story, the students were hanging out in the rotunda waiting for a lab to start, and um, I don't know what magazine they had, Men's Health, GQ, something. But in the back of the magazine, there they found a bottle of pheromones for sale. And uh, they, they pooled their money and, and bought the pheromones. And, uh, and when they came, they, you know, they showed everybody in the class. It was a little, little bottle like this. And uh, a male in the class volunteered to wear the pheromones and see if his dating world improved. And so while we, you know, just imagine every morning hey, he's getting ready and splashing the pheromones on his body. Every class for two or three weeks started with, uh, I won't share his name, but you know, all of a sudden, any more, you know, are women asking you out? Or are you asking them out? Are they saying yes? Anything changing in your dating life? And nothing ever changed. Nothing ever. He never had anything to report, and we soon lost interest in him and quit talking about it. We ultimately concluded that uh, the students had paid uh, 50 bucks or whatever it was for a bottle of horse urine. Because remember, pheromones are in every body secretion. So who knows what, he, what they bought. All right, next, classification. I hate this, but it's necessary. And it's necessary because it allows us to talk about these two different mechanisms. In other words, a hydrophilic, water-loving hormone versus a hydrophobic, water-fearing hormone. The way they act is very, very different. The way they act is very different because of the nature of cell membranes. So we'll look at a uh, picture from last semester. Just to remind us of the the nature of a cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer. So you've got the phosphate groups, which are hydrophilic, the hydrophobic chains forming the core of the membrane, which is hydrophobic. 
So if we kind of diagram that, the inner and the outer surfaces are hydrophilic, corresponding to the phosphate group, but the core of the membrane is hydrophobic, corresponding to the hydrocarbon chains. So water cannot do that. Water cannot cross the cell membrane. Anything hydrophilic cannot cross the cell membrane. Take a minute, bring Biology 111 back to the tip of your tongue. That membrane has a lot of proteins embedded in it that allow things to move in and out. <clears throat> For example, proteins with little hydrophilic channels <coughs> that will allow water to cross. So what this means is if we're talking about a hydrophilic hormone, have a membrane bound receptor <clears throat> H in that red triangle if you can't see it a hydrophilic hormone has to have a membrane bound receptor because they can't cross cell membrane. While a hydrophobic hormone can cross the cell membrane. So let's let me write that down and make sure you write it down. So hydrophilic cannot cross the cell membrane. They have a membrane bound Receptor. Hydrophobic <coughs> hormones can and do cross the cell membrane. They have a cytoplasmic receptor. 